take up your hymnal over there. We're going to turn in our hymnal to hymn three, or 478. Okay, I probably need to put my glasses on today. <laughs> hymn 478, Seek Ye First. This will be our fellowship hymn. All right, well, if you have your Bible, why don't you turn with me to uh, Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. And I want to apologize again because, you know, we've taken a 13-week, now this is the 12th week, but we've taken this 13-week course through the book of Hebrews, and I've just preached a few passages from each chapter, and I know you're like me, you're saying to yourselves, but what about this verse? And what about this passage? You know, the pastor treats one and you see another one and you say, ooh, I want to I wanna know more about that. Yeah, it's, it's so hard because, you know, Hebrews is just packed. It's packed. It's like Aunt Virgie's Mississippi mud cake. It's thick and it's rich and you just can only get in little bites at a time. And that's the book of Hebrews. So I hope that in I hope that you've you've learned and you to appreciate the book of Hebrews as we've done this, but also that it has inspired you to read more in the book of Hebrews and do some study in the things that you want to know more about. Because really, I've not I've not hardly touched the exhortation part. You know, mostly it's just been exposition about Christ, and that's been you know for me when I prepare my sermons. Sometimes I, sometimes I get drawn off into other things, and I think, okay, wait a minute, what's my theme? Who is Jesus? Let's go back to that, because I want to stay with that through this entire series of messages. And today, we're going to look at verses 1 and 2 in chapter 12. Who is Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith? Who is Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith? So in this series, so far we've looked you know, at all these chapters last week. The writer showed us that Jesus was our great treasure when I talked about Moses and his rejection of Egypt and all the treasures there for Christ. This week we'll read that he's the author and finisher of our faith here in verses 1 and 2. So let's read those together. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Father, help us now as we consider these words the apostle gives us. Father, that you would speak to our hearts now. Give me unction as I preach, for I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Verse 1 then, wherefore seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Recently, I reorganized my library at home. Um, or should I say, I finally organized my library at home. We finished painting the basement. Now, the basement painting project took us two years. Denise and I don't do anything quickly. And we started two years ago, and her mother passed away, and that just knocked us off the nut. And we finally got back to it and said, okay, we're, no matter what, we're going to finish this. And actually, she did the majority of the work uh, to finish the, the painting of the basement. 
We still had the paint. We still had brushes. We had all the things we needed to do. We just had to move things. And so one of the things that we had to move was we had to uh, move the books that I had in, in this particular part of the basement that we were painting. I had moved the books out of the shelves and the shelves off the walls. So I told Denise, I said, don't reshelve anything because I need to systematize my library. I've got to have a way that I can find what I'm looking for. My books were just in a mess. So now my books are of more use to me because I can find what I'm looking for quickly. I have it systematized in a way that makes sense to me and is easy for me now to find what I'm looking for, a particular author or a particular subject. And so I was sitting in my office the other day and I relished the fact that I was surrounded by the old men. You know, all these books in my office and all the old men that are there. And I could just choose any one of them at any moment and just have fellowship with a member of the cloud, you know, as he was speaking to me through his writing. And that's kind of like, you know, what we have in this cloud of witnesses surrounding us. In my library, I have Thomas Manton, and I have Charles Spurgeon, and William McCulloch, and John Willison, and John Bunyan, and Flavel, and Baxter, and Owen, and Brainerd, and all these guys, and so many more that are there that I can reach out and commune with through the books that they wrote, and I can study, you know, in the cloud of Puritan and evangelical witnesses. I like to think of it that way, you know, with Denise... Sometimes she'll go off and, and see her dad or she'll, she'll leave the house and she'll say, don't be afraid because I'm leaving. And I'll always tell her, no, I've got the old men here with me. I'll be okay. Yeah. But the cloud of witnesses that the writer mentions here in chapter 12, seeing we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, points back to chapter 11, Right? So he's referring back to chapter 11 where he illustrated faith with Abel and Enoch and Noah and Abram and Sarah and Moses and, and Joseph and Rahab and the many others. And he gets to the end and he says, but time would fail me to speak of David and Samson and Barak. And, and then he begins to name all these other uh, worthies that are in the cloud. So the cloud then is filled with these folks that he's mentioned and now, with so many more, I mean, we could think of the cloud in, in terms of these worthies, but there are so many others now that from the church have walked and run this race, and they're part of that cloud. And so when we're talking about a race here, think of the cloud like a stadium. You know an Olympic stadium? And there are seats that go around in that long oval? And... And there's a race being run, and the people in the stadium are watching that race. And so these witnesses, then, we are compassed about in this stadium where the race is being run with this cloud, this stadia of dignitaries, of worthies who have run the race before us. Yeah. And then notice that he says, let us lay aside every weight. Now here we have another Hebrew salad. We have two leaves of lettuce. This is the first. He says, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us. So with, with such luminaries watching, we want to run like they did, right? By faith. And so the writer builds on the theme of the stadium and the theme of what they did of the event there that we're running in by giving us the first part of this by saying, let us lay aside every weight and the sin. Now there's two things here. First is the weight. Notice that. Lay aside every weight. Weights are not sins. Not sins. But there are things in life that crowd against. Have you ever I don't know, maybe some of you have owned a cat or perhaps you have a cat in your neighborhood like Denise and I do. We have a cat in the neighborhood. And when that cat's ready, that cat wants to rub up against you, you know. They just kind of sneak up and they rub up against you. Well, that's kind of like these weights. They want to, they kind of move in and press up against. You know, that's the idea here. 
These weights are crowding against us. They're reducing available time for the race. They eat away at interest. They deprive us of energy. They claim an importance that's not true. And they leverage the tendency towards inordinate affection and disguise themselves as good distractions when in reality they bleed us of our perseverance. And I've seen it happen to Christians my entire Christian life. I've seen it happen to others and I've seen it happen to myself. And as I said, these weights are not sins, they're just things. For example, a boat can be a weight. Because what does a boat do? And I know this is sort of one of those traditional illustrations that we think about a lot or you hear people talk about. What does the boat do? What does it demand? If you buy a boat, what does it demand? It demands to be used. You're not going to buy a boat and set a boat someplace, right? You're going to buy a boat and you're going to use it. And what else does it demand? It demands fuel. It demands repair. It demands maintenance. It demands upkeep. And so what happens? We buy a boat and suddenly the boat says, okay, buddy, here you go. Here's what you have to do. You have to use me every weekend and every vacation time that you've got because if you don't, you're going to feel like you've lost money on the deal. And I'm going to break down several times, so you're going to have to do something about my maintenance and you're going to have to put me someplace, so you're going to have to pay rent on that place. And you're going to have to and, 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 and you might say, well, I need a wakeboard or I need some skis. I need a tow rope. I've got to have, you know, the right kind of this and the, that, that kind of that. See, that's what happens. It's a boat. It's not a sin. But what does it do? It demands something. It, and they always do. And what happens when they demand these things? They crowd out. They deprive us of energy. They deprive us of time. They deprive us of resources. They claim an importance that's not true. It's actually kind of a red herring. It's, it's the, I would call it the devil's red herring. Because you, you, you come along and you're, you're so excited about walking with Christ Jesus and you're, maybe you're new to the Christian life or maybe you're a longtime believer, but man, you just really, you realize how important your devotion life is and you realize how important it is for you to lead your family a certain way and you come out of church and you're all excited and you go home and you open up the paper and the devil says, here's a boat for sale. You like boats. Let's go buy a boat. And suddenly you're, you're off the track. You're, you're, down, you're down at Harbor Freight or wherever they sell boats. Not Harbor Freight. You're down at the store and you're buying the boat. And then you're buying all the accessories and then you're looking forward to when you can go use the boat. And suddenly, the boat, which is not a bad thing, it's not bad to have a boat, but it begins to eat away at all of these things. It's a weight. Nothing bad about the boat at all. The only thing that's bad about the boat is when it pushes you like that cat. It leverages you towards inordinate affections so that you love the things about that boat more than you love the things about Christ and your walk with him. You see? Now, I just use the example of a boat, but I've never owned a boat, but there are lots of things in my life that have done the exact same thing. I get all excited about my walk with Christ and the devil says, hey, wait, wait a minute, what about that? And then I'm over here and I'm spending money there and I'm putting my time in there and suddenly I've left off what's really important for something that's not important at all really especially when it comes to my walk with Christ and so when he says lay aside the weight this is what he means lay aside those things that tend us towards disordinate affections lay aside those things that easily beset us Every weight, he says. Yeah, these aren't sins, but my goodness, do they have an effect? And then, not only is it the weight that he talks about we need to lay aside, but it's also, and notice this in the text, it's the sin. It's not a sin, a sin, it's the sin. The sin which so easily besets us. So this is what the Puritans would call the bosom sin. This is the sin. Everybody in here has the sin. It's that thing, that sin, that we are most attracted to, that tempts us the easiest, 
that draws us the quickest away, that, that, that titillates the passion the fastest. And it could be a number of things. But like I said, it's all unique to each one of us. It's always different. But it's always besetting. And notice what he says about that. Easily beset. The Greek word that's used here for this idea of beset means to constantly or easily draw away. That's the besetting thing. It's always easy. And so the sin is always the one that easily besets us, draws us off, knocks us off the nut, knocks us off the rail. And it happens just like that. Just like that. The sin that so easily besets us. So if we're going to lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily besets us, ladies and gentlemen, the thing we need to know is, what is the sin for me? I need to know what that thing is so I can guard against it. And I need to know what are those weights in my life that maybe I need to, you know, uh, pare down, get rid of. What are those things that weigh me down in the race? I need to know what the weights are. I need to know what the sin is. Because if I'm going to run the race that is set before me, well, I need to get rid of that stuff so that I can run. You know, it used to be when I was a boy, I grew up in Louisville, Kentucky, and every year at the Derby, they would put in the paper uh, the losers. You know, they, they, had, uh, they had a list of all the horses that were last place in the Kentucky Derby. I always looked forward to seeing that in the paper because they had a picture of a horse with a jockey and the horse had the jockey's lunch on one side and a, a, and a um, flashlight on the other and a tire iron on the other side and a spare tire on the other side of that. And, you know, the jockey had on a winter coat and a big hat and, and lots of jewelry. He was really weighed down and the horse was weighed down. And so these were always the losers. And so when I think of this sin which so easily besets us. I'm like Mindy when she thinks of that lady whose piano stool broke when she sang that song. Every time I read this, I think of that horse in the, in the Louisville Courier Journal when I was a boy growing up. Every year they had a picture of that horse in the paper because it's weights and sin that so easily besets us. It weighs us down for the race. And then we have our second leaf of lettuce here. Let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Notice that this race is set before us. We don't get the chance to choose what race we run. You know, when you go skiing, you go to the mountaintop, and uh, you can go down the bunny hill for beginners, or you can choose the, back, the black diamond course. And if you're, not a, if you're not a skilled skier, you don't want to go down the black diamond course, right? <laughs> but we don't get that choice and, of course, there are courses in between that, but we don't get that choice in the Christian race. We get one thing, and that's the black diamond course. We get the hard one because we're running a race, and it's an important race, and it's a difficult race, and there's lots of things in the way that want to trip us up and beset us, the weights and the sin. And, you know, we have an enemy that's laying that stuff out in the course for us. Don't you think for a moment that the devil doesn't want to knock you off course? He's a busy man. And notice that he says here, this race, we run with patience, the race that is set before us. It's set before us, and the one who set it before us is Christ Jesus. He has chosen the race that we run. And as I said, we don't get to choose it. He does, and it's unique to every one of us. I said it's the Black Diamond Course, but he knows what Black Diamond Course you need. And that's why the writer tells us, now the just shall live by faith, back there in chapter 10. And then in chapter 11, now faith is, it's right now. Faith is to be experienced right now. It's to be used right now. It's now. It's in this moment. We don't wait for later that we can express our faith. We express it right now in the decisions that we make every day. In this race that we run, it's a race of faith. We are running a race in this moment, a course unique to each one of us. 
with weights unique to each of us and bosom sin unique to each of us. And notice what the writer says here. He says, let us run this race with patience. Patience, then, is the key to running. Because if we're going to make it to the end and cross the line and join the cloud, we have to have endurance. And endurance means patience to keep going. And as we look back to the men and the women in chapter 11, we can see what their patience produced. Abel's patience produced an acceptable sacrifice. Enoch's patience produced a godly testimony. Noah's patience prepared an ark for the saving of his house. There's a man that needed patience. Abram's patience caused him to obey the call and to leave, not knowing where he was going. Sarah's patience uh, gave her the ability to conceive, faithfully waiting her entire life and then having a child in her 90s. Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, they had the patience to speak about a future hope, a hope that they would never see. That's patience. Moses had patience to endure persecution with the people of God. Rahab had patience to produce a hospitable entrance to the spies, and her patience led to the saving of her house because her dad, her mom, her brothers, her sisters all came in to that house, and the only building that wasn't destroyed in that city was Rahab's house because she had patience and her faith led her to patience. Yet this is a faith race. But remember what Peter said. Remember what Peter said about this race. Besides this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. Be careful that you don't get knocked off the faith race and you start adding to your faith all the weights. And you start adding sin. No, don't get knocked off. Here's what you need to purchase. This is the truth that you need to buy. Virtue and knowledge and temperance and patience and godliness and kindness and charity. Yeah, this is a faith race. And so along the way, this is what we're looking for. But what a wonderful segue into the next verse. Looking unto Jesus. Looking unto Jesus. Now we turn our attention from the cloud in the stadium around us to the author, to the one who started the race. The Greek word mean, translated looking here means to fix your eyes trustingly on someone. So trustingly looking to Jesus. And we're told to look to the dignitaries of chapter 11 in such a way. We're not told to look to them in that way. We're only told to look to Jesus in that way. The hymn writer put it like this, turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Yeah, you want to take care of the weights that are weighing you down? Look to Jesus. You want to take care of the sin that so easily besets? Look to Jesus. All of these things will grow strangely dim. And we'll look back and we'll say, well, how come I don't love that anymore? How come that's gone from my life? It's because you've been looking to Jesus. See, a cloud of witnesses is wonderful, but ladies and gentlemen, it's just not enough. No joy or rejoicing exists in the cloud of witnesses. Only a recognition of past accomplishments. And their faith and their patience in running the race are a great example for us. But that's all it can be. It can just be an example for us. Their works don't touch us in a real way. But for the writer of Hebrews, there is one, capital O, N-E, whose experience touches all who come to him by faith. Jesus is the author and the finisher of our faith. Now this word author is the same word that he used back there in chapter 5. Being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. Here it is in chapter 5. We have it now again here in chapter 12. Jesus is the great causative. He's the one that started the whole thing. He's the one that set it before us. He's the one that has designed it for us. Jesus is the author, the beginner, and he is the finisher. Here's another word. 
that the author has used before in reference to Christ. In chapter 2, verse 10, For it became him, the author says there in 2.10, for whom all things for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons to glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. Just so, as God has finished and brought to completion our redemption in Christ, so now Jesus is finishing or completing our faith to the praise of God's glory. Have you ever seen someone take a piece of wood and finish it? For example, someone making a piece of furniture. It's beautiful to watch. And I always, I don't know about you, but I always watch something like that, and, and I'm in awe. Because it's, it's not just <clears throat> the mechanics of carpentry. It's really an art. Anybody can make a box. But it takes a true artisan to create a beautiful piece of furniture. I'll never forget sitting at a, a, a family reunion, Denise's father's family they held a reunion every year for many years and I remember sitting with one of her cousins and he owned a cabinetry business and he he made cabinets for people oh I don't know all over eastern Kentucky and and into um, eastern Tennessee and they would go in and they would build cabinets to to you know design cabinets according to the owner's wishes the the buyer's wishes and he was, he was telling us about this fellow that he had hired, and he said, I just don't think he's going to work out. And uh, I said, well, how come? What's, what's, he said, well, he said he can build a box. He said, but he, he can't finish a cabinet. And I thought, well, that's, that's kind of like me. I mean, if he were to hire me, I can build a box. Now, it wouldn't be square, but it'd be a, I mean, you could say it's a box. But I could never finish it. But that's not Christ. He is the author. He built the box. And he is the finisher. He perfects the box. Our faith is what he perfects. So as God finished or brought to completion our redemption in Christ, so now Jesus is perfecting us. And how is he doing it? He's doing it in a race that we're running in a race where we have to lay aside weights. In a race where we have to be careful of the sin. And we have to watch ourselves. And we have to be mindful of what we are and who we are and the race that we're running and the Christ that we're pleasing. And remembering all the example of those around us and how they ran their race. Because, you know, in those seats, in that stadium, there's somebody who ran the race somewhat like me. Who had the same weaknesses and peculiarities that I have and I can learn from them so that I can run the race and be like Enoch that at the end of my years someone will say he had a godly testimony yes let Jesus finish our faith well he's going to isn't he because once we come to Christ the author has already designed for us the race to run. He is already doing the work of finishing our faith in this race. And I was thinking this, uh, this morning as I was um, during Sunday school time, I was reading through the passage and I thought, you know, I bet there's a psalm that goes with this. And the, the psalm that occurred to me that really kind of speaks to this whole thing is there in Psalm 121. I love the ascent psalms. And for, so from Psalm 120 to Psalm 135, you have what's called the ascent psalms. And it's the travel log of the Israelites when they would go up to the temple in Jerusalem. They would sing these songs beginning in 120 and going all the way through to 135. And I thought, you know, I bet in the ascent psalms, there is a psalm just for the race runners. And sure enough, here it is. I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills from whence cometh my help. My help comes from the Lord, which made heaven and earth. He will not suffer thy foot to be moved. He that keepeth thee will not slumber. Behold, that he that keepeth Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. Now, let me just stop right there and say this. All those who are attacking Israel, they need to read that verse. God's not going to slumber on Israel. Verse 5, the Lord is thy keeper. The Lord is the shade upon thy right hand. What does a runner need when he runs a race? 
The sun shall not smite thee by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve thee from all evil. He shall preserve thy soul. The Lord shall preserve thy going out and thy coming in from this time forth and even forevermore. Yes, we run a race. We run a race that's set before us, whom the author and the finisher of our faith has already run and is now finishing our faith. He's our chief example for how to run the race. Because it says, who for the joy that was set before him. So we too have a great joy as James exhorts us. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into divers temptations. And every time I read that, I think, Where, who is this guy telling me to be happy about divers temptations? We too have a cross, of course, not like his. He endured the cross. But we're told in Matthew by our Savior, take up your cross and follow me. Matthew 16, 24. Jesus knew about shame because he despised the shame of the cross. John Bunyan tells of Christian and faithful as they entered Vanity Fair. And if you've read uh, Pilgrim's Progress, uh, Bunyan has evangelists come and meet the two before they enter Vanity Fair. And evangelist tells them, he says, now look, you have to go through Vanity Fair because your Savior went through Vanity Fair. He said, and the celestial city is just on the other side, but you must pass through. And, that, and Christian and faithful pass through Vanity Fair, and the people are amazed at them. They're amazed at their clothing. They're amazed at their speech. They don't like them. They try to sell them goods, and Christian and faithful don't buy. And so they're just offended by them, and finally they, they bring them before uh, the, the magistrates. Let me read to you just a little bit from... Uh, Pilgrim's Progress here. Then were these two poor men brought before their examiners again, and they're charged as being guilty of the late hubbub that had been in the fair. So they beat them pitifully and hanged irons upon them and led them in chains up and down the fair for an example and terror to others, lest any should speak in their behalf or join themselves unto them. But Christian and faithful behaved themselves yet more wisely and received the ignominy and shame that was cast upon them with so much meekness and patience that it won to their side several of the men of the fair. This put the other party yet into a greater rage, insomuch that they concluded the death of these two men. Wherefore they treated them, therefore, wherefore they treated them, they, tr <clears throat> let me if I can read, Wherefore they threatened that neither cage nor irons would serve their turn, but they should die for the abuse that they had done, for deluding the men of the fair. Then were they remanded to the cage again until further orders should be taken with them. And so they put them in and made their feet fast in the stocks. And of course, it is there in Vanity Fair where faithful dies. The cloud of witnesses stands in the stands of the stadium, and Jesus, as king and victor, sat down at God's right hand there in the stadium, watching, waiting. Because, you know, once the race has concluded, the victor receives the crown. And who gives the victor the crown? The king does. The prince, who happens to be over the race. And so Jesus, sat down at the right hand of the throne of God, completes the idea of this cloud, this stadium that we're running in. He's there in the principal spot on his throne, waiting and watching. He begins the race. He finishes the race runners. And this is something that, of course, the writer of the Hebrews loves, loves this image and repeats it over and over again of Jesus being set down at the right hand. He uses it in chapter 1 twice. He says there in verse 3, Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. And then in verse 13 of that first chapter, he quotes Psalm 110. But to which of the angels said he at any time, Sit on my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. And then in chapter 8, verse 1, Now of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. We have such an high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. And then again in chapter 10. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. He loves this picture 
And so he builds this little illustration for us of the runners and the stadium and the stands and the cloud of witnesses that are watching and the king seated on his throne ready to deliver the victor's laurel to the runners. And he's set and he watches. Look to him. Looking unto Jesus. Look unto the hills. From whence does my help come? My help comes from the Lord of hosts. It doesn't come from the hills. The stadium's wonderful and those cloud of witnesses are great, but I can't call on any of them to help. But I can call on that king seated there on that throne to help. Yes, I will call on him, the Lord of heaven and earth. So how do we apply all this? Well, I think we've done plenty of application throughout the sermon, but number one, let us lay aside the weights. We need to identify weights that keep us from running the race, don't we? What are they? Listen, I get it. I feel it too. There's stuff in my life I need to, you know, cut out. They're not sins, but they tend me to draw me off into other things. Let's find out what those are. Let's, uh, let's lay aside weights. Secondly, we need to identify the sin. What is it? What is that thing, that sin that is so attractive to me that it easily, it easily besets me? What is that thing? Let's identify it. Because once we know what it is, ladies and gentlemen, we can go to the king on his throne and say, hey, here's the problem. This is it. Let's identify the sin. And let's fix our eyes on Jesus. Yes, it's wonderful to be surrounded by the cloud of witnesses. I love to sit in my office surrounded by the old men. But I don't pray to any one of them. They're there for an example, but that's all they can give me is an example. There's one that I can call on who will actually in real time affect my life. He's the only one. So let's fix our eyes on Jesus. Let's take our eyes off of the weights. Let's identify the sin in our life so that we can run the race with patience and endurance and make it to the end. Amen. Let's bow for prayer. Father, now would you help us? These are hard things. They're hard the race is hard. And there's lots of things that I need to address. Each one of us needs to address them. Father, that you would speak to us today. To all who hear this message and help us to address those weights, that sin. That we might keep our eyes focused on our Savior. What a wonderful Savior. How great he is. Oh, let help us to turn our eyes to Jesus, to look full in his wonderful face, so that the things of this world might grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Father, do that for us today. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, if you'll take up your hymnals and stand once more as you are able, we are going to turn to hymn 338. How firm a foundation in 338.